Uh, I want to invite your attention to Acts 2, if you would, please. We'll start with Acts chapter 2. And if you want to join me, I'll begin reading at verse 41 to the conclusion of the chapter. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church those that were saved. Uh, the ambassadors of Christ, the apostles that uh, you might remember were hand-selected by Jesus, they faithfully and, and boldly proclaimed the gospel in the city of Jerusalem less than two months after Jesus had been crucified outside that very city. This divine message that they were preaching, a message of salvation, a message of hope, through the redemptive work of Jesus, was met with ready acceptance among many Jews. Look there at verse 47 that we just read. Notice it says, praising God and having favor with all the people. Notice verse 41 that reports that on that first day of this preaching in the city of Jerusalem, some 3,000 souls were added to the number, that is, the number comprising the church. Uh, two chapters later, look at chapter 4 and verse 4, we can see that this very favorable growth continued in the early days of the church. Verse 4, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Uh, there is some discussion as to whether this was an additional 5,000 to the initial three or maybe in the aggregate now, 5,000, but obviously indicative of the fact that many of the Jews favorably received this message by obeying the command to repent and be baptized. However, despite that positive note, the apostles' preaching of salvation in the name of Jesus and God's raising him from the dead, it was not well received by the Jewish leaders. Look, if you will, beginning in chapter 4. And as they, the apostles, spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the, the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. The Jewish Sanhedrin, which was the high court among the Jewish people, they convened the following day and they brought the apostles before them for interrogation and eventual threatening. Threats, although they're not special, uh, particularly identified for us, no doubt threats of punishment if the apostles continued to preach in the name of Jesus. I want us to notice how the Jewish Sanhedrin's threats were responded to by Peter and John. It's difficult to know because it talks about the apostles, so we're not sure if there were others besides Peter and John. They seem to have been uh, the primary preachers on the occasion. Uh, but whether it was just Peter and John or whether they were just spokesmen for the entire group, notice how they retorted to those threats. Look at chapter 4, drop down to verse uh, 19. Well, look at verse 18, the threat. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all 
nor teach in the name of Jesus. When Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I want to quickly read uh, for your consideration these comments by Brother Bowles on that verse. He says, quote, The Sanhedrin was in a dilemma. If the Sanhedrin said it is right to hearken unto God when God authorizes the thing to be done, then the apostles would continue to speak in the name of Jesus. But if the Sanhedrin should say that it was right to hearken unto its decision, then it would be teaching to go contrary to the authority of God. Peter gave them to understand that they would continue to obey the authority of God regardless of the decision and threats of the Sanhedrin. This was, please listen to this, this was an open defiance of the authority of the Sanhedrin when it conflicted with the authority of God. Well, as you probably know, and if you did not, you should have recognized from uh, what Brother Bowles said about what this response by Peter really implied, because that's what happened. Their threats of punishment, the Sanhedrin, it did not deter the apostles from their faithfully acting upon the commission that Jesus their Lord had given them. Notice, if you will, chapter 5. Look at chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest doth no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. They continued to preach. They continued to do these marvelous miracles of, of healing in the name of Jesus. They did not stop, despite the Sanhedrin's threats. Well, the Sanhedrin's acted upon their threats. Because learning about the apostles still preaching in the temple, they sent representatives of the Jewish authorities to arrest the apostles and imprison them. Drop down to verse 17. Then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. They laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. You might remember that night an angel, an angel miraculously released them from that prison and instructed them, verse 20, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Well, the Jewish Sanhedrin convened again. The only thing missing were the apostles, because when they went to the prison, they were in a quandary. The prison was still locked. The guards were still outside guarding it, but no apostles. And so as they were discussing what may have happened, all of a sudden, one of their cohorts came in and said, they're back in the temple preaching. So they went. They laid hold on them, not trying to make any uh, tumult among the people, because now the apostles were in very good favor with the, with the people. But they brought them before the Sanhedrin again. And uh, here's what they were asked. Look at chapter 5, verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you? that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Listen closely to Peter's reply. Verse 29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Again, Brother Bowles on that verse makes these comments. Here Peter, as in Acts 4.19, states the principle that should govern all Christians. When there's a conflict between the authority of God and men, 
we must obey God. God comes first. Obedience to His authority takes precedent over all other authorities. Here, the conflict is between obedience to the Sanhedrin or obedience to God. Peter, without any evading or equivocation, states positively, clearly, and emphatically that he and the other apostles are going to obey God. Well, I use that rather lengthy introduction to take us back where we left off. We are in the midst of a series of studies that we have entitled The Mechanics of a Monarchy. Uh, That is the the workings, uh, the functional operations of a monarchy. And the reason that's significant to us is because spiritually, as members of the church, we are a monarchy. We're a kingdom. And since as citizens of our fair land, the United States of America, we don't really have much acquaintance with a monarchy. In fact, as we've stated numerous times, our nation grew out of a revolt against a monarchy. And so maybe it's not only we're not familiar with it, maybe we don't take kindly to the thought. However, as Christians, we need to be acquainted with it. Because spiritually, we're part of a monarchy. We need to understand its workings. And so that is the design of this series. We've done some preliminary studies about the purpose of civil government. We've talked about the principle of authority. But now we're looking at the parts that are shared in common with any monarchy, earthly or spiritual, earthly or heavenly. They all have a king, subjects, and law. And we're looking at each of those component parts as it relates to authority. The king is the person in authority. We've studied his role, the things that he is to recognize, and his responsibilities. Now we're looking at the second of those component parts, subjects. Subjects. Here are the people under authority. The king's authority. And so we talked about their role. And and their role is well defined by the name that we give them. Subjects. They are to subject themselves to the one who has authority over them. And this is to be a voluntary subjection. Uh, In fact, uh, as we looked at commands that are given to Christians in 1 Peter chapter 2 and then again in Titus chapter 3, we understand we are to subject ourselves. It's passive. You know, this isn't by compulsion. This isn't because we're compelled to be subjects of some government. Well, as Christians, we are to recognize in our role as subjects, we are to subject ourselves. And oftentimes, that's the language we encounter. Subject yourselves to the ordinances of men. All right, so that's their role. Then we started looking at recognitions. And what I mean by that is, you know, what are some intended recognitions that God would have all subjects of all monar- uh, monarchies, as well as all other civil forms of government? What would he have subjects recognize? Well, the first one that we called attention to, as you can see on your outline, is uh, God intends for all subjects of all civil governments, but particularly of monarchies, since that is our paradigm, if you will, He intends for them to understand that the reason that they are to subject themselves under the authority of the king is because the king has been given authority by God. In other words, he has delegated authority. Hence, the king, the monarch, or any leaders of whatever form of civil government, they all have authority owing only to the fact that they were given that authority by God. It's delegated authority. And so, as we read in Romans 13, the idea is, if you resist that authority, the monarch's authority, you're resisting God. One of the motivations that you should have for subjecting yourselves is for conscience sake. You don't want to violate God's will, God's plan in this arrangement. Over in Peter, where we are told to subject ourselves to, you know, civil government, he says, for the Lord's sake. See, that's why we're doing it. It's not just fear of punishment. If we choose to disobey and become lawbreakers and have to suffer fines or imprisonment, 
maybe even capital punishment. No, that's not the primary motive. The primary motive is for the Lord's sake. Because we are to recognize that the power they're exercising, that is, monarchs, kings, any civil leaders, they have been given that authority by God. They're acting as His representatives. They are called ministers of God in Romans chapter 13. And so how we respond to them is, in effect, how we respond to God and His authority. All right, well then, the second recognition that we went on to explain is really an easy segue from the first. If that's the reason we're obeying the king or whoever are those civil leaders, their moral character has no bearing on our obedience. We have to be very careful not to look just at the human representative there on the throne. It doesn't matter his or her morality or ethics or justice. We need to look beyond them to the power who has given them authority, and that's God. Even to this group, the the Sanhedrins, the Jewish leaders, Jesus said, they sit in Moses' seat, so you listen to what they tell you, just don't follow their example. See, their authority, their position of authority has been granted them by God. Now, if they abuse that authority or if they fail to, uh, in earnest, abide by the law themselves, well, you don't follow their example, but you must follow their teaching in the same way as it relates to civil government, human civil governments. We cannot allow the morality or immorality of the king, the monarch, the civil leaders to decide whether or not we're going to obey. You know, when Peter called upon those Christians in Asia Minor to obey every human institution, and he says, whether it be to the king, you know who that was? We talked about it. It was Nero. Nero. They were to honor the king. Nero. And we know that he was an enemy of Christians. He put many Christians to death. Uh, Many believe that he was responsible for Paul's martyrdom, and likely even Peter. And yet here is Peter saying, you need to obey him. All right, well, the third recognition comes right down to our introduction. There is one qualification. We are to obey the king, the monarch, Civil authority, regardless of their behavior, their temperament, their their ideology, we're supposed to obey them, except for one occasion. And that's what we read about there in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5. It's when their dictates contradict what God tells us to do. In that situation... God intends for us to make this recognition. Well stated by Peter, wasn't it? We ought to obey God rather than man. Now, they were religious authorities, but as Jews, Peter, John, the other apostles, they were to submit themselves to that until their commands went contrary to the commands of God. That's the one exception. And again, this recognition derives from the same first recognition or the same principle of the first recognition that God's authority is supreme to any man's authority. And the only reason man has authority is because it's been delegated by God. And so they, even a king, cannot command us to do something contrary to God and expect our allegiance to that. Now, again, Jesus' apostles provide us an excellent example of this, and uh, I trust we understand, uh, again, this qualification. But let me quickly call this to our attention, which you probably recognize. Were there adverse consequences for this recognition and acting upon it? For instance, when 
Peter and James finally said, we need to obey God rather than man. Did that end the discussion? Did that end the court proceedings? No. In fact, we learn that the tribunal on that occasion, the Sanhedrin, what they were thinking to do is put them to death. That was their intention until finally Gamaliel stood up and reasoned with them. If this is just of men, it'll go away. If this is of God, you better be careful what you're about to do because that's going to be interpreted by God as fighting against him. So they didn't act on their intention to kill them. Rather, they brought them back in, threatened them again, told them, don't preach anymore, and then beat them. Beat them. I'm assuming this was that 39 lashes to spare violating the law of the 40. But whatever beating it was, it was obviously an unpleasant experience. Adverse consequences for acting on this recognition that when man's authority contradicts God's authority, we have to obey God. Faithfully acting upon that recognition has often come with a high cost. We go back in the Old Testament and find so many examples of this. Think about when God's people were carried off into foreign captivity. Now they're living under foreign kings. Many of them heathens, pagans. Didn't believe, didn't recognize their God, Jehovah God, the God of heaven. And yet they were required to live under obedience to those civil authorities. And sometimes they had to acknowledge this recognition. We can't obey you if in doing that king is going to violate our God. And so Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, erects this tremendous statue that either was in honor to him or to his gods, And here was his edict. Here was his command to all those who were under his authority. When you hear the music, you bow down to that image. Well, there were three Hebrew youths there. Came over with Daniel. Mishael, Azariah, Shadrach. And they didn't. People, obviously they're the only ones standing when the music's playing. And so finally it got back to the king. And he said, king, some of those... Jewish captives you brought over here that you have put in positions of authority, they are not obeying your command. You go back there. You, you read Daniel chapter 3. You see how the king responded to that. It said he was infuriated. So he brought them in. And he said, is it true? Is what is being reported true that when you hear the music, you're not bowing down? And before he ever gives them an opportunity to... to answer that, he says, but I'm going to give you another chance. If you hear the music, will you bow? Because if you don't, the penalty still stands. For you or anyone else, you will be, burnt, you will be thrown into a fiery furnace. You remember how those three Hebrew youths answered? Essentially, they first said, we're not careful how we're going to answer you, king. This isn't going to take a lot of delegation or diplomacy here. We're we're going to just tell you as it is. Our God can deliver us. Now, whether he chooses to do that or not, that doesn't matter. We're not going to bow down. Again, that enraged Nebuchadnezzar. So much so that he heated that fire. I'm not sure how that happened. But he heated that fire beyond what it was intended. So much so that the strongest in the army that were that were commanded to bind those three men and throw them into the fire, they died as they threw the three Hebrew youths into the fire. But you know who didn't die? The three Hebrew youths. They were, they were acknowledging, they were acting upon this recognition. We have to obey God. rather than, We can't bow down to any other God, Nebuchadnezzar. And you remember then, shortly after that, Daniel 
their companion. Well, this was by trickery or deceit because of jealousy on the part of other leaders within the now the median government. But they came to Darius and they said, hey, Darius, we got a great idea. In fact, everyone has agreed. Interestingly, Daniel, no doubt, had not agreed and he was the first. He was the highest of those presidents. But they came in and said, Here's what we're thinking, Darius, as, as a way to honor you, anyone, anyone for the next 30 days who makes a petition to any man or to any god other than you, Darius, they ought to be thrown into a lion's den. And I'm not sure what Darius was thinking. Maybe he was filled with pride, but he said, that's a great idea. Now, the thing is, at this point now, law had taken on, among the Medes and the Persians, law had taken on the quality that once it was signed into law, not even the king could change it. And so sure enough, he signed off on that. They went and watched Daniel, knowing that he would continue to pray. And they brought back the report and they said, you know, you, you, you signed this here, Darius. And Daniel is violating. Darius all of a sudden had second thoughts. The Bible says he spent all night thinking about how he could deliver Daniel, and he could not. So finally those, again, other leaders who were envious of Daniel and his position, they came back and said, all right, king, you need to act on your law. You signed it. You can't retract it. And it grieved Darius, but he had to do it. Because... Daniel was acting on this recognition. Darius, I can't obey you if in doing that I'm going to disobey my God. And my God wants me to commune with him. My God asked me to pray with him, and I'm going to do that. Now again, it grieved Darius. Darius would finally learn that, again, the Hebrews God could deliver. And he delivered Daniel. And so he took, he took justice upon those who had accused Daniel. But the point is the same. Ask Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Now, now we're not dealing with foreign kings. Now we're dealing with the kings, the monarchs, who were over God's people, who should have believed in God, who should have understood themselves this recognition that if their command as a human monarch contradicts God's command, you can't obey that. And yet here's Zedekiah, last king on the Judean throne. And Jeremiah was preaching, preaching, preaching. Surrender to the Babylons and you will be spared. But if you resist, the Babylonians will come in here, they will level this, uh, this city, they will burn it, and you will be carried captive over to Babylon. Zedekiah the king kept insisting Jeremiah change his message. He was a very politically weak figure. You, you read him, he's constantly vacillating. But nonetheless, he imprisons Jeremiah. He puts him in a mire pit. He threatens to kill him. And Jeremiah, in principle, continued to say, Zedekiah, when you tell me to do something contrary to what God tells me to do, I've got to listen to God. Now, quickly, before we end our study here, um, please understand, as Christian citizens of our own nation? It may be that we're going to have to pay a hefty price for acting upon this recognition. Are we supposed to be law-abiding citizens? <laughs> we're supposed to be the ideal citizens among a crooked and perverse nation. We're supposed to shine as lights. We're not supposed to give the unbelievers any reason to think other than that we're law-abiding citizens, except for that one exception. When the, oh, when the civil government commands of us to do things that we cannot do, such as stop preaching about the sin of homosexuality, or 
not permitting women to take authoritative roles in the church. And I don't know, I'm not a prophet, but I sure see those things coming on the horizon. You know, there might be a hefty price to pay. There might be fines to pay. In fact, it was this recognition and the potential adverse consequences that caused me to go to my insurance agency and ask for a liability policy as a preacher. I remember hearing Brother Greg in Newport News say, if I get put in jail, I expect some of you to come and visit me. You know, the reality is there. I think we are blind to expect differently as our culture is constantly changing. <clears throat> there might be a high price tag. But <laughs> may we never waver. May we, like Peter and John, boldly say we have to obey God rather than man. All right, finally, responsibilities. And we can go through these pretty quickly because I hope we have established subjects are responsible for implicit Implicit obedience to the king's authority with the one exception that we just noted. Now, again, I am not so naive to believe that all citizens, for instance, in our own country, find subjection, submission, obedience, welcomed responsibilities. As I said, you know, we don't like the word subject. You know, we're okay with citizens, but subjects? I'm not sure many people in the United States would welcome that idea. But we are. We are. As Christian citizens of our nation, may we understand the responsibility that is ours. Enjoined upon us by God. Obey the civil authorities. Again, with the one exception. Matter of fact, I hope we have spent enough time on the Word itself and the, I, and the instructions that are given to Christians as found in the New Testament that this is supposed to be willing subjection. It's supposed to be voluntary subjection, which leads then to willing and voluntary obedience. May I take it one step further? May I submit that in principle... Christians are called upon to do this and all other of God's commands without murmuring and complaining. Over in Philippians chapter 2, you might remember there that Paul had given Jesus as the perfect example of uh, the type of mind we're to exhibit. And then he goes on to say, verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It is... God, which works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure, do all things. I'll repeat it. All things. Would that include the instructions to obey civil authorities? Do all things without murmurings and disputings. You know any complainers? You know any that love to complain about the government? That first word, murmuring, suggests, quote, a secret displeasure not openly avowed. It, in other translations, is translated complaining, grumbling, and then disputing or arguing. We're not going to take the time. I'm over time already, but read Colossians 3. Uh, a little different paradigm. Now we have servants to their masters, slaves to their masters, but even there. Notice the reason that they are to submit themselves and to do it heartily, heartily. Think about a slave being told by his master what he's to do, and he is to do it heartily. As to the Lord and not to men. Yeah, that principle well translates into our obedience as subjects of a Civil authority. Uh, I, I'm glad, you know, sometimes you read commentary and you think, I know that, I know that, I know that, you know, glad to hear it the way they're saying it. But 
then sometimes you just pointed to a verse and said, wow, how did I miss that one? So over in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 12 or 10 and verse 20, as it relates to our subject, and then hopefully we can find application to ourselves, listen to this. Solomon says, curse not the king, no, not in your thoughts. You know, sometimes we're the murmurer, (laughs) we secretly have displeasure with this, even though we might not want to openly avow that, but... (laughs) Solomon's wise counsel is, you better not curse the king even in your thoughts. Maybe this is where we get the little bird. You ever hear that a little bird told me? Remember? He's going to say, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Maybe that's where we derive that. I always wondered that. Little bird he told me? I don't know. But Solomon used the idea. And you know what? God doesn't need a bird to let him know what we're thinking. I was glad to run across that verse. It should help us as Christians understand this is not just a matter of our behavior. This is a matter of our attitude. Our heart. All right, well, certainly we need to guard against that even as our culture changes. Uh, I, I would urge you to listen closely to what Peter says about one of the characterizations of some of the false teachers of his day. He said they uh, are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And Peter says there is stern, severe judgment for that. Brother Woods comments, they regarded all authority with contempt. We certainly would not want to be associated with that group of people, knowing of the judgment that God has reserved for them. Finally, uh, there are other responsibilities, obviously, attending subjects in addition addition to the overall, the, the umbrella of implicit obedience. Now, all of them grow out of that, but there are some more specifically that are stated in Scripture Uh, Some that have to do with the maintenance of civil authority. Hence, for this cause, pay you tribute also. Taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. And you might remember who is our perfect exemplar in that when the Jewish leaders tried to entrap Jesus with regards to paying taxes, what did Jesus tell them? Well, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Peter, go out, (laughs) and here's the temple tax. God intends for us and Jesus as God in the flesh, exemplified for us, the responsibility we have to pay taxes. What about praying for them? Now, obviously, now we're into Christian citizens and our responsibility. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, this is to have some priority in our lives. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks is to be made for all men, for kings, and for all that in authority. You know, protests and rallies, they might not effectively change the minds of our politicians. But you know what is effective? Prayer. Prayer can do far more than what we would ever ask or think. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, it is that which avails a lot. Let's pray for them. And then how about love them? Mm. Love them. We're not going to take time, but please do. Romans 13, immediately after this Instruction with regards to how we ought to, you know, our our attitude toward people in civil authority. The next thing he says is, oh, no man anything but to love one another. Let me ask you, would that apply to kings? Would that apply to the civil authorities he was just talking about? 
And you know how comprehensive love is, right? If you have forgotten, go read the love chapter again, 1 Corinthians 13. Here are the qualities of that command. Love one another, love all men, agape, agapeo. It's patient. It doesn't seek ill. It seeks the best. And then, and I wish time, I would have managed my time better. I wanted to go read Jeremiah. Remember that king, Zedekiah, who put him in prison, threatened to kill him? <laughs> like I said, he, he was a weak political figure. He, he was put in place by Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, but anyways, I mean, he's going from side to side. When, when Jeremiah is in prison, he goes to Jeremiah and says, what actually does God intend for me? Jeremiah <laughs> essentially told Zedekiah, I've been telling you this. Here's what you need to do. Now, he's not going to obey. But he, here he is seeking Jeremiah's counsel. But here's what I want you to listen to. Here is this religious leader, this monarch, who despises Jeremiah. I mean, again, he has threatened him. He's, he's ready to kill him. And listen to Jeremiah's love for this man. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, they shall not deliver thee. See, Zedekiah was afraid. If he would follow Jeremiah's advice, then these other you know, political leaders who were so against Jeremiah would kill Zedekiah. Jeremiah is promising him, assuring him with God's promise, they will not deliver you. Listen to this. Obey. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord which I speak unto thee, so it will be well with you. What is love? Seeking the highest good of another. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they've done to you. You love them. You seek their highest good. And here is Jeremiah pleading with Zedekiah, pleading with this monarch. Obey. So it works out well for you. Your soul will be saved. Love them. That's probably not easy to hear that counsel sometimes. But again, it is a responsibility. God enjoined upon all subjects of all civil authority. So, I say it's not easy. Now again, I hope we can look finally to our culmination in all this as we think about the monarchy of which we're subjects. Remember who our king is? Not hard to love him, is it? Because he's loved us with a greater love. I mean, the greatest love. He's loved us. He's, he's always going to only command us to do what is good, what is in our best interest. He protects us. He's promised us an inheritance. He rules over us with goodness. Not easy to love him. Other monarchs, maybe not so easy. But I trust we will do that for the Lord's sake. The song we're singing is, what will you do with Jesus? See, that, that's kind of going to eventually bring us to what we're going to talk about. Having Jesus as our king, what will we do with him? And so uh, as we sing this song together, I ask you to think seriously about your own spiritual relationship. And if there are others who might need our help in understanding what they need to do, please let us know while we stand together and sing. We'll sing stanzas one and three, please. <laughs>